have seen India now get a very strong political mandate from Mr. Modi uh, in this in this scape of things. Uh, has the story decisively changed for India? Um, the perception and the direction of India has changed. I think we all know that Mr. Modi is seen as a very impressive leader. Yeah. Granted, I think his controversy is, is disappearing and he's seen more and more as one of the three or four important leaders in Asia. Mm. And I think there's a very positive view about the prospects of India in the next several years. The ability of him to galvanize the country uh, under his leadership and to get more and more states behind him, mm -hmm. I think is it's the first time you've had a leader like this in decades. That's right. I'm going to talk about Indian markets. We've just hit lifetime highs uh, in trade. The question is, what's backing this euphoria? What is it that markets are preempting, which is making them celebrate the way it is? Well, first of all, you've got to believe that there is, a, in fact, a, a Modi premium. Mm. Uh, number two, when you look at the emerging markets, emerging markets for the most part, there's a very few emerging markets that one is hopeful about having positive growth. Mm. I think we all know that India in 2016 is forecasted to have greater <laughs> marginal growth in its GDP than China, mm -hmm. for example. And when we look across the world, there aren't that many emerging markets that are in this period of lower um, oil prices in a relatively strong position. The lower, lower, or the lower oil prices, sorry, it's actually is going to, to, is going to benefit <laughs> yes. uh, the Indian economy markedly. And I think all of those things, and remember for a long time people were not investing in India. That's right. So this, to a certain extent this is an overreaction to that. So do you believe this is the start of the investment cycle in India? We are an emerging market darling, so to say. Some people are even beginning to say that the whole BRIC concept is redundant now. It's only India and China in the emerging market category that's actually driving growth uh, in Asia. Are you someone who believes uh, that? Because stock markets have rallied, what, 30%? I think you have to be careful to make cross-the-board statements. I think you're... You and I are smart enough to know that India is going to be looked upon within certain sectors, mm. and Mr. Modi has obviously encouraged investment in four or five sectors, some of which are infrastructure-related, because he knows that that really has to get fixed right. if the backbone of the economy is going to continue to move. How does Blackstone see India in the emerging market pack from an investment point of view, from a point of view of uh, a country that's got a very decisive political mandate, that's perhaps beginning to see the first signs of a turnaround? Uh, from a Blackstone point of view, how is India in that pecking order of emerging markets? You did say uh, things are beginning to change, but how do you view it? Well, Blackstone has invested in India for many years. Hmm. We've obviously invested in a number of sectors, uh, among them real estate, and we will continue to look selectively at real estate assets uh, across the country. I think even this week we've perhaps made a few investments. Mm -hmm. um, we've looked at infrastructure areas such as power and power generation, and that will continue as well. Do you expect consolidation in a sector like bank, which is very high up on the government's radar? What about information technology and also healthcare for that matter? Getting a lot of mind space as far as global investors are concerned. Will Blackstone be looking at that uh, basket? Um, if you look at Blackstone's history, hmm. the, we haven't really invested too much in financial services. That's right. So I would say that's probably not the case. We tended to be also have a fairly cautious view and a selective view about um, technology and software technology and information technology. So I would say the likelihood that we're going to participate in a consolidation in that space in India is fairly small. You know, when Ben Bernanke whispered the word taper last year in May, uh, emerging market currencies went through a period of extreme, extreme crisis. Uh, now when Janet Yellen begins to rise rates eventually, which she is expected to this year, uh, do you believe a market like India has braced up for that eventuality? Uh, I think it's hard to make that generalization because remember many emerging markets right now have debt that's denominated in dollars mm -hmm. and as the dollar has risen in uh, value, the, the uh, liability of those nations has increased. I don't think that in fact is the case for India. We all know that the central bank in India is, is very conservatively managed and I think that will therefore put itself in a much stronger position. But even while the central bank is conservatively managed, what was your view on the Indian rupee? Uh, even though there are early signs of a turnaround, inflation is under control, our deficits, twin deficits, both current account and fiscal deficits seem to be uh, under control. But the rupee has been relentlessly weak. It hasn't really uh, risen from levels that we did see uh, before the word taper, I mean, when the taper tantrum did happen across the world. I've got to confess, I'm not... I, I, 
I think currencies right now are very hard to judge mm -hmm. because we're probably going to enter a period of a lot more volatility. I would think in the short term the rupee may strengthen mm -hmm. for the, some of the reasons I've talked about early in this interview mm -hmm. relating to the perception of Modi, the perception of more capital coming into the country and probably the likelihood that they're going to keep interest rates relatively stable. Let me ask you a quick question on India before I move on to the U.S. because that's, again, a very big talking point. Uh, U.S. in the developing markets and India in the... In, in the developed markets and in India and the developing markets seem to be the secular story of for investments at least in the next two to three years. World Bank seems to suggest so, IMF seems to suggest so. In fact, World Bank has even gone on to the extent to say that India may catch up with China by fiscal year 17. Are you somebody who's as optimistic or are there pockets of concern that lie in India that bother you? And which uh, ones are those? Well, you're, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, I love India. It's a fascinating country, but we have to know it's a very big country. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of economic zones in India that are very successful. Mr. Modi's Gujarat is one of them. There are a lot of other parts of India that have a long way to go in terms of um, employment, uh, economic regeneration, and what have you. So I think we, can't, we cannot make... Uh, some big generalizations and when you look at the infrastructure challenges that's right. that India has that's not something that's going to be fixed in the short term mm. that we're talking five ten years mm. before that type of change that type of restructuring is actually going to occur Fair point indeed. Let me just move to the U.S. In fact, this is the unprecedented recovery of sorts. It's very distorted. U.S. seems to be growing faster than most people had anticipated. Big fault lines exist in uh, Europe. China is going through its own turmoil. What, according to you, are the biggest risks as far as the global recovery is concerned in all of this year? I think the biggest risks this year probably lie in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, um, Europe has had a period of um, stagnant growth. Uh, it's showing marginal deflation on the periphery. Um, there's enormous uh, fragmentation and nationalism appearing in Europe. Mm -hmm. The whole question of the democratic model, whether it's the UK, France, or, or uh, Italy or Greece, is breaking down. Um, other than Mrs. Merkel, mm -hmm. it's hard to find anyone that can manage uh, a perspective of keeping the euro together of dealing with the whole uh, issue of Putin and the whole resolution of the Ukraine. Mm. And also Mrs. Merkel, to a certain extent, has had a lot of more challenges in the last six months with the whole Islamification um, trends, uh, anti-Islamification trends in Germany, the perception of the economy is under-investing in a number of sectors, mm. and the fact that the German economy is probably underperforming more so than the average consumer in Germany expected. I'm going to speak about Islam and the threat it poses to places like France, and it seems to be a watershed moment in parts of that world. But let me also speak to you about, uh, you've outlined the obvious concerns that exist in Europe. But what about the United States? It's growing at a faster pace. Before crisis, U.S. was seen as this single engine of growth. Do you think it's dominant enough to uh, resort to that uh, level once again, to be the single engine of growth in the world? Well, the, the U.S. economy is growing. It's fueled by a lot of things. Uh, real income is up. Uh, among consumers around 1% to 2%. Uh, housing uh, prices are up, housing um, demand is increased, and of course we know the energy prices have plummeted sufficiently so that the, the consumer has a lot more money in their pocket. Um, for all those reasons, uh, coupled with the fact that the economy itself uh, is fairly strong, if you look at the big sectors, That's including right. technology, mm. uh, despite the fact that the dollar is so strong, these sectors continue to perform very well. Let me also ask you a question on crude because you mentioned energy prices that have plummeted. Nobody on earth knew that crude is going to crash the way it has. We saw peak oil and now we are of course seeing very cheap oil. Uh, the first question on crude is do you expect oil prices to be so low for a prolonged period? And it's obvious ramifications on economies around the world. It's great for importers like India, but what about oil producing countries? Um, it's an interesting question. It's an important question. I think we don't see oil going above uh, 50 to $60 a barrel for the next 12 to 18 months. Mm. Uh, so we, we think this is going to be a phenomenon uh, characteristic of 2015 and 2016. Uh, this will pose a lot of challenges to countries like Russia, Venezuela, Iran, but at the same time, uh, it's going to force uh, a number of these countries, and you've heard this before, this is the old chestnut, maybe now these countries will start diversifying away from commodities, away from oil and gas, and diversifying their economy into a much broader basket of, um, 
of economic um, motivators. But what do these low oil prices mean for the big investments that have been planned in the U.S.? A lot of it tied to shale gas, a lot of it tied to other sort of energy investments. Uh, does this not put that into uh, a risk mode as well, especially for an economy that is being seen as being the savior of the world of sorts? Good question. I think you, like all things, it's hard to generalize. I think there are a number of larger uh, shale explorers who are going to um, hold, survive this period of two, three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. They're going to be consolidators and they actually will end up stronger. Those types of people uh, want to continue to survive and will be looking at oil prices uh, north of 50 to 60 for them to be successful. At the same time, there are a number of other smaller um, more debt-laden uh, oil shale companies who will probably either have to consolidate or have to restructure or just go out of business. I have a last question to ask you on our neighbors, China. The world seems to lose a lot of sleep over what's really happening there. People believe there is a uh, asset bubble as far as real estate is concerned. Many people are also losing sleep over uh, China slowing down on its investments. Uh, are you as worried about China as you are about Europe? I'm not worried about China as much as I am about Europe because mm. you have one clear difference in China, which is you have one clear leadership framework mm. that's very firm, very tough, and to a certain extent, President Xi is the strongest leader that China has seen since Mao. That's right. And he's been very disciplined about anti-corruption, uh, focusing on the environment, as well as focusing on the consumer. And granted, he's got a whole range of issues, mm. but he's trying to manage it in a very cautious, measured, and concerted way. So. When you compare that to Europe, which we know is fragmented, lots of disagreement, and no clear leadership, other than possibly the Pope. Uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> remember, you still have the Pope, and he's, he's turning out a fairly good performance so far. Uh, I would say that China uh, worries me a lot less than Europe. He is drawing record audience wherever he's going, especially in Malaysia. But the last question I want to ask you before you, I let you go, and I know you will say, you do not want to preempt what she does, but when do you expect Janet Yellen to raise rates in the United States? Because this obviously has repercussions for the rest of the world, including emerging markets uh, like India. Inflation in the U.S. has still not risen, and it obviously has repercussions on the, on the whole investment scenario in the U.S. also. Janet Yellen is a very, very strong uh, leader. She's got a great team. She's a class act, uh, very transparent with how she shares information. Um, I, I think she's very mindful of... Um, deflation mm -hmm. and some of the threats of deflation and I would be surprised if she raised rates uh, in 2015. So she's not going to raise rates in 2015. You expect the first rate hike to happen only in the first quarter of 2016 calendar year? I said I'd be surprised if she raised rates this year. I think I'd, I, if you ask me the question again in the fourth quarter of this year then I'll give you another answer. We'll talk again. Thanks very much for speaking to us. Always a pleasure talking to you. <music>